right, welcome to Dan Bristow. Hi, how are you? I'm, I'm well, thank you. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's uh, really great to just uh, get a chance to read your book, Schizostructuralism. We wanted to invite you on to the program here. Uh, we're starting a conversation series with the study groups and uh, you're the first, uh, the first author that we are interviewing. So um, we're very tickled to chat with you. Uh, Dan has written a really nice uh, book on revisitation of a lot of Lacanian uh, concepts of structuralism through uh, Wilhelm Reich, Freud, uh, of course, Lacan uh, is the primary interlocutor in the text. Uh, and it, 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 it's, a, it's a really, really um, concise and, and fabulous intervention. It's published with the Rutledge uh, lines of the Symbolic and Psychoanalysis series, which is edited by Ian Parker. Um, Dan is a psychoanalyst, and uh, his first book was called Joyce and Lacan, Reading, Writing, and Psychoanalysis. And uh, some of the concepts developed in that text uh, are continued on in schizostructuralism. So uh, again, welcome, and let me ask and start off with the following question. Um, when structuralism was uh, in vogue, to some extent it's still uh, talked about quite a lot in academic circles. Um, many of the authors who were called structuralists rejected the title and uh, therefore the, the whole status of structuralism has created quite a lot of confusion. Um, could we begin with how you work uh, on, on the definition of the term structuralism? Yeah, okay, I think that's a, a really important uh, issue issue to raise, actually. Um, and, and thanks again for having me, and it's a, it's a real honor to be the first guest. Um, I, I guess for me, one of the most succinct sort of definitions of, of structuralism, perhaps in a high structuralist period, is, is when the um, French journal, the Cahier pour l'analyse, is, is published, uh, beginning in 1964. It's quite a short-lived project. Um, it, its lead article was uh, Lacan's uh, Science and Truth before it, before it appeared in the Ecree. Um, and in the foreword, I think, I think to the first issue, uh, Jacqueline Miller, he, he sort of puts forward the definition um, abiding by the rigor of the concept. And I, I think that really gets at, at the nub of what, what structuralism is about. Uh, perhaps Miller may have lost some of that rigor subsequently, um, it, it, but I think his, his material at, at the time was, was extraordinary in terms of, of, of what structuralism sort of was and, and what it represented. Um, the articles from, from that journal are, are collected in a, a collection published with Verso, I think in 2012 called Concept and Form, um, edited by Peter Hallward and Knox Peden. And working through that, you really get a sense of something that holds together. That's kind of what a structure is as far as, as, far as I think it, um, something that holds together within itself. Um, and perhaps, perhaps a way of interrogating structuralism is to run it through what, what comes after and, and what is other, other to, to structuralism. So uh, maybe the whole project of, of Jacques Derrida and uh, deconstruction. And interestingly, Derrida has an article in, in the Cahir. Um, uh, I think it's his article that, that made it into of grammatology on, on Levi-Strauss and Rousseau. Um, the way it's that Derrida reads these structuralist texts at his best moments, is almost in a, a hyper-structuralist manner, I, I would say. It's, it's, he's really pitting the text against itself and seeing where that rigor perhaps falls down. It's a, a reading of texts when there is nothing outside the text. You know, that's, that's the sort of famous Derrida line. Um, so, so I think deconstruction sort of throws what structuralism is in, into sort of sharp relief uh, as, as well. Um, when he visits Lacan, I, I wonder if he isn't quite as rigorous himself. He sort of picks Lacan up on sort of schoolboy errors rather than, than, than the sort of 
rigorous moments of, of theory itself. You know, he, he's misquoted something rather than, um, rather than, you know, looking into the very architecture of, of Lacan's uh, thinking, which is not to say that his texts on, on Lacan are, are, are nothing short of, of brilliant. I, I think um, I, I sort of read the postcard, uh, that, that book, as, as Lacan read The Critique of Practical Reason by Kant, he said it's one of my favorite novels. And uh, I, think, I think the same about Derrida's sort of work at that period is it's really great writing, but perhaps it, it loses something of that interrogation of structuralism that, that came in these early extremely rigorous works within, within deconstruction itself. And then perhaps that throws a, 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 another term out there, which is, which is post-structuralism. Um, and, and that becomes a, a tricky concept in, in relation to these previous two as well. What, what exactly is it? The De Deleuze and Guattari? Uh, uh, some of these people that you mentioned sort of rejecting structuralism, did they then you know, become post-structuralists for that very reason? It's, it's an interesting question. And, and what defines uh, post-structuralism, I, I think maybe remains a question. You know, the Deleuze and Guattari, they, they, they sort of give birth to this wealth of uh, ideas that, that, that are incredible, the assemblages, the multiplicities, the planes of imminence and consistency, deterritorialization. You're really interrogating structures as well, the Oedipus um, in, in anti-Oedipus. Um, and of course, central to it is the, the category of schizophrenia and, and division and, and the splits. So, I guess my intention was to sort of bring that back from where it ends up in post-structuralism to seeing it as integral to structuralism itself, that, that the split, the division, which is always there through Lacan when he's talking about the subject is precisely a structuralist and structuring uh, uh, sort of fundament. Um, and, and Lacan is taking off uh, the very late Freud when he's, when he's talking about the Spaltung and, and the split in his very late work, um, he's sort of reading this into psychosis initially, but he sort of conjectures that maybe it's more general, general than that. General, perhaps, to the subjective structure itself that that we are all divided subjects, and that's perhaps what animates us. So one of the very uh, nice little maxims of Lacan, I think, that is developed in the seminar seventeen on the other side of psychoanalysis is that the truth is always me dear or half said and you uh follow this um other side uh, uh of of psychoanalysis in ways which in, in many ways i see as the kind of um core of uh the schizo structuralist uh proposal that you're putting forward here and you um, invent a new concept um I think that it's fabulous. I think more people need to be inventing uh, concepts to to uh, assist us as we as we work through some of these questions. Uh, because what what you argue is that um, what's at stake is an understanding of the kind of constitutive basis of of both the subject as well as of the of the unconscious. Right. So uh, the, this this therefore uh, means that structuralism. Uh, enables us to sort of get at the heart of this, uh, of these major uh, points. Now, the concept that you invent is called unverite, and it's um, seeking out the other side, okay? The, it's seeking out the half said, um, or what you say, quote, unifying division that is always within structure, right? And that this is what produces the unconscious and the subject of the unconscious, right? So I want to invite you to... Um, talk a little bit about this uh, concept that you developed, which actually was developed in your first book on Joyce and then continued on into this work. Yeah, I, 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 I take off of the, um, the French title of, of Seminar 17, L'Envers de la Psychoanalyse, um, and, and combine the Envers, which I guess it's, it's sort of most literal translation is the, the inverse, um, uh, uh, it's Russell Grigg who gives it the, the translation, the other side, and in his translator's note gives a lot of other um, resonances that can, that can be found in, in, in that word. So sort of the seams, 
the hems, the the lining of clothing, something that's not seen on the outside, but that underpins uh, underpins things. Um, you know, there's almost that resonance of upside down. Lacan was actually toying with the idea of calling it psychoanalysis upside down initially. Um, so all, all of these things are sort of right there in 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 this word on there, um, and then it, it combines with verity. You know, as 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 you as you say, this this notion of of truth and, and Lacan's always very interesting on on truth and and the fact that truth can only ever be half said does imply that you know this some other side where maybe the the other half resides in in, in a way. Um, so it is an interrogation again of these these splits and the integrality uh, of of the split itself. You know, how how integral that is to to sort of ingeminating any structure, subjective structure, unconscious structure, um, as a sort of primary thing, but a, or maybe an originary thing um, in which there, there already is some sort of animating antagonism, um, maybe similar in, in a way to, to, to Derrida, uh, again, with the, the concept of difference, but, but I think slightly different to, to that as well. Um, and I, I sort of, Go off uh, so sure actually when when he's talking about um, taking a a sheet of paper and seeing it having two sides, and what he says is that you can't cut with a pair of scissors one side from the other. Um, it's sort of a very obvious statement. I mean, I, I can sort of show you if you take a sheet of paper. What he's saying is that you can't cut this way uh, and cut cut side one from side two. Um, so when he's talking about, about this sheet, something that is one as the sheet itself and has two sides. As two sides, it produces the one. As the one sheet, it produces the two sides and, and, and neither of those can be there without each other in a way. Uh, I think this sort of harks back to Hegel's dialectic as well and, and the, how integral the, the sort of element of the third always is to anything uh, structured in in two, if you like, or or, or you know, sort of one divides into two, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, which I guess sort of pits it against the idea of the of the binary and, and and binarism, which just takes the idea of two in itself and and doesn't see how it's both united and separated by this third element, which is uh, uh, on verity or um, as I also call it, the, the unificatory separatory principle. So, so it's sort of, there's something always there which both splits and uh, ties together. And, and you can't have sort of um, almost any, any structure without, without this uh, initial um, uh, thing that, that unites what it separates and separates what it, what it unites. Um, of course, with the sheet of paper, you can also make this a one-sided uh, uh, surface as well. If you if you turn it into a, a, a Mobius strip, um, but that's a, a whole other area of, of, of topology. So so what social works with is, is the is the strip, the yep. band um, with with two sides. So on topology, I think um, for a lot of analysts. Um, Trudging through the late Lacan, or even readers of Lacan that are coming from from to to the to the work for in different uh, uh, for different motivations and different reasons, uh, most or a lot of what the structure that uh, the topology is trying to articulate is, of course, the Freudian structures of neurosis, psychosis, perversion, um, and of course you have obsessional part of that and so on. Um, I thought it might be nice because within your text. There's fabulous diagrams in two of the main chapters um, on topology and on surface and even in other places too. So you seem to have uh, quite a lot of um, um, comfort maybe or ease uh, a little bit, at least with the topological uh, concepts. C can I invite you to just uh, share um, a little bit about sort of why you uh, find the, the, top, the, the topological concepts to be um, useful as a, as a psychoanalyst, and then also um, how, in fact, they really do kind of uh, help us a little bit with understanding uh, structures that we find in the clinic. 
Yeah, okay. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think it, the, the, the late work of Lacan, when he gets very invested in topology, it, it, it can be quite baffling. Um, it can be, uh, it can seem quite alien. And, and I, I think it is quite, quite alienating in, in a way just to read, just to read through it. Um, and, and that sort of uh, shows the necessity of, of actually practicing topology. I, I think this is, this is what's important. It, it sort of reminds me of uh, what Lacan says at the beginning of seminar seven when he's talking about uh, Freud's project for a, a scientific psychology. He says that we, we can't really talk about this unless we have the text and the diagrams and the symbols in front of us. We, we, we can't sort of retain it in our, in our mind. And there's something about topology which is similar. You, you sort of need to be uh, immersed in it as a, as a practice or even the sort of practice of drawing um, to, to, to sort of get what's, what's going on and what's being said. Um, yeah, Alan Badger uses a term in his little book on Hegel of, of 1978, he, he uses this term dialectical topology. Um, and I think that sort of really gets at where topology falls perhaps between theory and practice in, in the psychoanalytic clinic. I guess when we begin to practice, um, we, we recognize that, that the interrelationship between practice and theory is, is really there, but it, it's quite hard to pin down. It's not actually as neat as all that. How does it, how does it come into the clinic? You, know, uh, it, it, you, you need a theoretical basis, but it's not sort of an obvious toolkit. You, know, you, you can't just sort of go in there and, and apply it uh, um, so, so easily. Um, so I think that topology, it, it, it can look quite different in the theory and in the practice. I guess in the practice, you're sort of really within the topology of something. You're within the topology of the surface of transference. You're within the topology of the structures of whatever clinical category you, you, you might be working with and the array of symptoms that, that sort of come with that. In, in the theory, I guess you've got um, more opportunity to, to work more discreetly and, and directly with the elements of the structures of these surfaces and being away from the sort of knottiness of, um, of the therapeutic rapport. You, you can sort of then untangle things uh, in, in, in that time and, and sort of theorize about, about things. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that Lacan left psychoanalytic theory with really in, in this in this moment of, uh, you know, re real upheaval, I guess, towards the end of, of his work and life, he was you know, dissolving uh, the school and the seminar and, and so on. And what it's had a tendency to do is, is become a bit congealed. I think, you know, this, this uh, field of practice that's, that's so open to extension and experimentation, even, even in mathematics, it's a relatively young branch of mathematics and it's, not only professional mathematicians who have made sort of the, the great discoveries in topology, it's often amateur enthusiasts because it's quite tactile and you, you, can, you can do stuff yourself if you like without having all of the algebraic theory, set theory, which underpins the mathematical formalization, but isn't uh, necessarily uh, what goes on with playing with bits of string and pipe cleaners and, and what have you. Yeah, I guess I'm another another uh, person I, I I sort of draw on in, in the book is R.D. Lang, um, and what's interesting in, in in both Lang's and Lacan's late work is they both get interested in knots. Lang, in a a more metaphorical and and formulaic way, perhaps, Lang sort of talks about well, he sort of synthesizes uh, life experiences into these different types of entanglements, and then tabulates. Um, all these forms of relationships and their results and consequences. So in this book, Knots, which it, it reads like poetry, but you have sort of every, every possible iteration of a relationship between Jack and Jill and, and how it goes. So Jack likes Jill, but Jill doesn't like Jack. Jack doesn't like Jill, but Jill likes Jack. Jack likes Jill, but he's too afraid to say, but Jill doesn't like Jack. Jack likes Jill, but he's too afraid to say, but Jill also likes Jack, but he, you know, she's too afraid to say as well. 
so they never get together all of this he's just playing for every every sort of type of what he calls a knot i suppose topologically it's not exactly a knot because a, a, a knot is um it, it, it's made of uh, a sort of loop that's, that's tied or that's fastened in itself so when we tie our laces that's not a topological knot um a topological knot the the simplest is the, the trefoil i have one here uh, so it's completely uh, uh, sort of fastened um, structure or surface rather. So Lacan is, is getting interested in knot theory, the theory of links, and it's, I think it is important to insist that we, that we refer to the Borromean rings as a Borromean link because they're not a knot. Uh, a knot is made of one uh, a loop, uh, a link is made of more than one one loop, and and Lacan corrects himself in in seminar twenty three at, at certain points. You know, he's it's it's not a problem that that mistake was there. It might be a, a bit of a problem that that mistake is perpetuated in some of the more um, dogmatic ways of just referring to what the Borromean rings are, uh, only in the sense that it might prevent uh, uh, ongoing work with with these structures. So I think it's again, a very rigorous uh, field of theory and practice. But it's not, it's not that rigid. It's, it's quite fluid in a certain way, in that what topology is the study of is surfaces that maintain properties through any type of deformation. So bending, uh, stretching, crumpling, you know, it, the, the surface itself remains fundamentally the same. Uh, so famously in topology, a donut is the same as a coffee cup. Now, the, the reason is a donut is a sort of torus. If you imagine taking a donut made of some malleable material, you sort of squash one bit down, stretch it out, and then maybe push your, your, your sort of fist, I've got a coffee cup, into it uh, to create this sort of cylinder, but they're stopped here without a hole. Fundamentally, this is the same as a donut because it's constituted as a surface with only one hole which is where this handle is. If there was another hole in here, it'd be a different surface. So the, the coffee cup is the same as the donut. I think a lot of what happens in Lacanianism after the late Lacan is really just a, a recapitulation often of what Lacan had, had done himself with these, with these links, uh, with the Mobius strip, with, with, these, with the cross cap, the Klein bottle, um, and and there's there's not many sort of extensions of of what's going on there, and and there can be, um, and and this is what I try to do, I think, in in the topology chapter of, of the book. Um, so I, I can I can run through a little bit what I guess I was trying to get up to with, with that, uh, with with the use of some some models. Um, now, if we take the the, the Borromean link itself, it's is this, it's, uh, it's constituted by there being three rings, none, no, no two of which are directly linked to each other. So if we, if we cut one, the whole structure falls apart. It's only through their sort of triplicity that, that there's this, this surface at all. Now it, we can imagine as Lacan does, each of these rings representing a different uh, order. We, let's say the black one is the, the real, we'll say the green one's the imaginary, the, the purple one is the symbolic. Topologically, if we take one of the rings and stretch it as a line to infinity, that is the same as it being a circle, fundamentally. So if we do this with, with the real, if you like, take it, stretch it out to infinity, we have to imagine it's going to infinity. We can then do sort of other things with, with the structure. What I try to do is to take the symbolic then and imagine the sort of signifying plane in, in itself and imagine the, the different clinical categories against, against this. Um, so, so the way I, I, I work with the category of hyster hysteria is, is like this. 
So if we imagine this uh, black line here goes extends to infinity as do the yellow lines. You know, what we could also do is just loop them over. It would be the same. In this demonstration, the, the black line to infinity is representing the real. The yellow lines to infinity are representing individual signifiers, let's say. And these blue loops holding them in the Borromean fashion to, to the real are elements of the imaginary. In the book, I call them autonomizing functions. So in the practice of psychoanalysis with somebody with the hysteric structure, if you like, maybe the analyst is uh, sort of confronted with this, let's call it a vocabulary of signifiers. So not, not, not words, but, but important uh, places of meaning, the, the signifiers. Let's say one of them becomes hystericized, you know, and it's what the, the analyzer starts talking about. And they're really convinced, maybe in, in the structure of hysteria, that this is what's going on with this particular signifier. What the aim of the analyst might be is, is to cut the imaginary link to free up that signifier again, that maybe what they really believe is going on with it is sort of lodged there in the imaginary and it's, it's being overcooked a bit. So we can work on that to, to untie something, to free up uh, uh, how, this, how this subject relates to their, their, their structure. Um, the other type of uh, neurosis is, is of course obsessionality. And I sort of picture this slightly differently to these individualized moments of the imaginary in hysteria as, as this, to have a sort of single ring of the imaginary that's, that's stretched out, that holds the signifiers to the real in a braid rather than, than in the same manner. So if we, we look that way, this one, they sort of alternate. Now, what happens here, we might be working slightly differently. You know, the analyst might see this this way, if you like, or, or work chronologically. In, in working with obsessionals, often uh, they're very good at talking about what they think the analyst wants to hear. Um, so in Deleuze and Guattari's terms, daddy, mummy, me, you know, we can talk at length about about something that might not be quite touching what's really bothering us, you know, with, with the obsessional structure. And that here is, is perhaps what we're talking about constantly. And maybe the work of analysis then is to, to free up this one, to, to, to cut that signifier out to allow access to perhaps what's hiding behind it, which is the real issue for the obsessional. And once that cut's been made, and that's the big, work, that's probably the hardest bit, because that has then been taken out of this uh, structure, it actually allows the next signifier just to slip off. Um, it's there in the Borromean fashion, when it's tied with the signifier before it, now it can slip off, and the rest is still held together, this can't slip off. It's, it's stuck between the ends of the, the imaginary loop, and you can imagine that going on and on with signifiers. I know this is a, a, a little in depth perhaps, but um, how I imagine perversion is perhaps the inverse of that. You know, uh, Freud says that perversion is the, the, the inverse of neurosis. Um, that's sort of taken to mean that the perverse structure is going about its business in, in an uninhibited way. Um, and I, I'm not too sure that it's as it's, it's easy as that. Uh, you know, there's this joke in Lacanian circles that there are no perverts in analysis because they're all out too busy enjoying themselves, which is which is a nice joke, but it might uh, it might stop us recognizing when we do have somebody with a perverse structure in in the clinic. Um, so it, it, with a perverse structure, the sort of roles the roles of the orders are reversed. Here we have a larger loop of the symbolic, holding on uh, individual bits of the imaginary, which manifest in the first structure as acts. Lacan picks up on uh, Freud's case of the young homosexual woman, 
um, that she's seen as a fallen woman and she she falls onto the train tracks in this act of an attempted suicide you know there we have an act which is trying to represent something symbolic and perhaps that's what's going on in in the first structure so that that's the way to, I, I conceptualize that that brings in psychosis um, and this is perhaps a little bit more provisional Lacan in, in his work on topology doesn't actually offer um, a, a, a link, a sort of depicted link of psychosis. But it, what he does say is that in psychosis, the, the real and the symbolic are linked directly together. Um, two, two rings that are linked directly together, that's called a Hopf link. That's the most simple type of link. Um, if these were unlinked, you'd, you'd have two, two rings, that's called an unlink. One on its own is called an unknot. Two or more that aren't linked to an unlink. So if the symbolic is directly linked to the real on the signifying plane, as, as I've tried to demonstrate with, with these other uh, neurotic and perverse structures, we have something like this. We can see these as signifiers directly linked to the, the line of the real, again, imagining it going on to infinity. And the imaginary is sort of out on its own a bit. And it might be sort of bouncing around here. It can come, come this way as well. It, it gets uh, detached. Um, and when, when these are linked together, what that might mean for the perception in psychosis is that all of the symbolic is perceived as the real. You know, that, that's, that's one definition that's given in, in Lacanianism to, to what's going on in, in psychosis. The way perhaps then to try to repair that is to bring in the sound term, which will link the, the imaginary back to uh, uh, the real, however provisionally, but, but perhaps something like this. So this sound term is linking through these signifiers and then linking the imaginary in, in the Borromean fashion. And this is what you try to do in the clinic with, with psychosis, is just to stabilize the imaginary to erect a signifier um, and, and to try and just fasten, fasten something between signifiers uh, to stabilize to stabilize something. That's, that's most of them. The other, the other link that uh, uh, Lacan sort of hazards is, is I guess, Joyce's link, um, which, is, which is always kind of separate. I, I, and I guess it gives, I guess it gives the basis of the idea of ordinary psychosis in some ways. Um, but, but what I'm interested in with the possibility of Joyce's link, which has, okay, this, this is a, it looks a bit like a spider. This, I'm using different, a sort of different color scheme with this one. We have this sort of brown ring, uh, which, is, which is here representing the real. We have a directly linked white ring to the real, which is, let's say, the symbolic order itself. The light blue one is the imaginary, and this fluorescent orange one is, is the sand term fixing in place all of the rest of the, the, the white rings, which we can see as individual signifiers. And something that Lacan says in Seminar 20 about Joyce is that he stuffs the signified with the signifier. He's just pushing as much signification as he can into into his work when he's writing Finnegan's Wake and what have you. And, and this might be a way of demonstrating that. You can put as many signifiers as you like into this sort of securement uh, without running the risk of, of going mad. I hope that was somewhat clear. No, that, that was uh, marvelous. Um, really, really got the, the, the tactile um, accessibility with those with those examples. Um, I want to shift gears slightly to invite invite the conversation to now discuss the concept of time, uh, mm -hmm. which I think will actually be will enable our conversation to make a pivot to the political uh, in a certain sense, because in your chapter on 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 Vernete, which is a conversation on temporality, um, 
you invoke uh, the way that a, a subject uh, invokes uh, what you call outside time. Yeah? And um, this is, for example, the time that one would speak of when they are trying to settle the score of a, f a familial generational trauma. Like it's obvious that um, European uh, white uh, people have a legacy of colonial um, genocide for which when we in 2021 speak of this um, experience, in a way, the register that we are uh, speaking to is in a way uh, the half set, right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's something, um, and this is a, a beautiful concept for um, thinking through problems of uh, reparations, for example, or thinking through political uh, problems of solidarity, race issues, colonial issues, etc. cetera. Um, can you start by discussing this unique form of outside time, where it appears um, and what, what interests you kind of uh, uh, about this? I, I guess on, on this score, um, when we look at where splits are in terms of structure, in terms of the subject, they're not unique just to that. There, there, there are splits in time as well and in different types of time. Um, so the way in, 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 in that chapter is to look at the, the sort of disconnect between individual time, if you like, and, and social time. And we might launch from um, Lacan saying that we're, we're always born prematurely, you know, the very temporal way of putting it. We're born into a system uh, that already pre-exists us of, of language without the language itself. We have to acquire it. Um, so there's, there's a sort of continuing time that's, that's going on and then our birth into it and our own subjective temporality within this, this sort of larger temporality, uh, 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 our individual time. Um, and that creates our being sort of out, out of time in a way, or, or, or rather for us, the, the time is out of joint to use, to use Shakespeare's uh, sort of beautiful phrase. Um, and, and, and this, yeah, it, it, it gets to those sort of questions of, of how do we make reparations? How do we properly apologize for the, the crimes of, of previous generations? Um, and I think it's I think it's a very striking uh, issue that 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 is difficult in in that you you might get a sort of figurehead of, of the state you know we we here we have Boris Johnson or, or or what have you but I remember I think it was Gordon Brown who sort of went to Bristol the epicenter of the, the slave trade in, in this country and apologized um, and it's a little bit late you know but at the same time it's absolutely necessary. Uh, but but there is that sort of that split in that that makes it both a little bit late and absolutely necessary. Um, so this 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 is something to do with time itself and the historical time uh, and 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 historical failures that is inscribed within this time and historical injustices that that remain with us due to due to these splits in time. We're, we're also born into all of those transgenerational traumas and injustices. So they, we, we, we inherit them as well. You know, they're, they're part of our language. So um, we often hear the uh, contrast between Jung and Freud, mm -hmm. but since Deleuze and Guattari's anti-Oedipus, they really helped to center, at least for left-oriented readers of psychoanalysis, the, the, the other distinction uh, in the Freudian school, which is between uh, Freud and Wilhelm Reich. Now, Reich is um, someone who um, had a completely different theory of death drive, but also gave a different account of, if you like, uh, how repression uh, is, is occurring uh, for subjectivity, right? And, and of course, he famously had certain political commitments um, uh, which 
in some sense account for this, but I want to invite you to, uh, because you uh, follow Lacan, but you really, I think, unlike a lot of Lacanians, are um, attentive to identifying the Reich-Freud split, which is an important split. Can you articulate a bit about uh, this difference as it pertains to the death threat? I, I think it's um, it, it's an incredibly important split in, in the history of psychoanalysis um, and, and very sort of productive and, and it raises a lot of questions, uh, perhaps one of which is, you know, what, what is psychoanalysis without the death drive? Um, and I don't know if Reich answers that entirely because he goes he goes elsewhere. It's a lovely thing that Badgie says, the only time I think he mentions Reich, but Reich goes elsewhere. He also says the same of Jung. Uh, but he sure he sure does. You know, he finds the the orgone, he's he he like every couple of years develops a new type of therapy, vegetotherapy, body therapy, um, uh, uh, bio, biophysical therapy, and then he's sort of chasing UFOs uh, towards the end and, and the orgone accumulates. It's all this wacky stuff that's, that's really quite fascinating. Uh, but maybe uh, uh, that sort of path is left open when, when you don't accept something of the death drive. Um, so Reich always wanted to stay on the side of life. Uh, he also, you know, was... Um, he was prey to a, a, a great deal of sort of excommunication himself, uh, like Lacan was, but, but dealt with it in a, in a very different way. I think he was expelled by the Communist Party, he was expelled by the uh, International Psychoanalytic Association. Um, he, he had his books burned by the Nazis, he had his books burned uh, by the FDA in, in the US. Um, and he was, of course, imprisoned and died in prison um, in, in, in the US as well. It's a very sort of troubled history, which, which you know, biographically says a lot. I think his divergences with, with Freud are on a number of questions that, that relate back to, to the death drive. Um, uh, his concepts of mass psychology, if you like, are, are very different to Freud's. You know, we, we use the term group psychology, but it's, it's the same in, in, in the German, I think. Um, and, and I, I find Reich very convincing when he's, when he's writing on the mass psychology of fascism, he sort of rejects the idea of uh, the Hitler psychosis. He, 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 he lodges much more of what's going on, much more psychoanalytically in a way, in uh, neurosis, in, in the authoritarian family structure. We you know, desire our own repression, as Deleuze and Guattari sort of say about micro fascism. And, and maybe that's what's going on in, in the rise of fascism. I think Reich at, at that point is at some of his most rigorous. And when he, when he is very much of the left, when he's younger, he, he's extremely rigorous. Um, whilst also having this idea that the orgasm solves everything and, and what have you, it's all, it's all sort of there as well at the beginning. Um, the, he, he absolutely rejected civilization and its discontents. He, he didn't like Freud's view of the, the social. Um, and it was to do as well with masochism and sadism and, and what's primary and secondary uh, with, within that, um, that I guess Freud sort of lends a, a complementarity to uh, masochism and sadism in beyond the post principle, which, which Reich rejects um, because the earlier Freud was kind of quite resolute that masochism is a secondary process to, to a sort of primary sadism. Uh, that, that we only turn against our, we, we only turn our sadism against ourselves. Um, and then, yeah, Freud, Freud sort of abandons that and, and says that there is the death drive as well as the eros. Um, in the concluding chapter, you offer an application of schizostructuralism to, to, to the concept of, uh, or the problematic of class struggle. And um, you begin by showing that we have a long tradition of a certain, um, a certain dualism perhaps within Marxist thought, which is centered on the conception of base and superstructure and the way that this then in, uh, ought to inform a certain dialectical 
uh, a concept of, of class struggle. But what you uh, show is in fact, um, this bifurcation is uh, uh, inadequate. And I want to invite you to talk actually about how you bring in Lacan's um, real symbolic imaginary or the RSI, in fact, to complement the, 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 the importance of class struggle, because you also, by the way, uh, bring in Pierre Bourdieu, the great French uh, sociologist, um, into the conversation. And so you, you, you find a, a, an incredible way, I think, to um, both refute vulgar Marxism of the base superstructure uh, dynamic, which we see in some forms of historical materialism and 20th century Marxism. Um, and you also invite a Bourdieuian analysis of different forms of capital, such as social uh, capital, cultural capital, etc., that Bourdieu works with. And all of that then is um, mapped onto the RSI. Okay, so that's the kind of overview. Now I want to invite you to um, tell us a little bit about um, your thoughts on this, because I, I love the way that I'm glad that this was the last chapter because for me, it connected all the others up together very nicely. Thank you for that. Um, I think this goes back to, to the question of, of, of the third and, and the, how essential uh, uh, having three categories perhaps, perhaps is to, to, the, to the dialectic, if you like, to, to um, separating things out. Um, and it's not to privilege any, any one particular uh, one of them. Um, this is what I'm trying to resist. It's not, let, let's call them oscillatory rather than, than hierarchical. Um, you know, you, you kind of guess that the real would be like the, 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 the one that's privileged in, in the top position, but, but really that all three of these sort of ideas of, of uh, what constitutes class um, are, are meant to be seen together. Um, It's only, I, I guess I, I use the term uh, theoretical fiction, uh, taking it from uh, Freud and the interpretation of dreams to designate metaphorically uh, uh, the economic relations through the concept of the real. You know, obviously it, it, it doesn't quite work with Lacan's uh, very precise idea of the real, which is unsymbolizable, um, uh, is, is impossible. But, but we can uh, productively uh, think about what's going on economically, because so often for, for the working classes, uh, for the proletarians and the precarious and, and what have you, it is beyond their means of control and, and is kind of in a similar place to the real, um, that, that the economic uh, relations structure uh, reality uh, uh, subjectively um, is one thing that, again, we're, we're sort of born into uh, and it inherits. Symbolically, there is the, cultural, political uh, set of uh, significations that we have to, to learn the language of to, to find our way in terms of, you know, what, what Bourdieu would call cultural capital. And that's, that's really going on. Um, you know, there's, there's these sets of ways of uh, talking to one another that, that allows some sort of social mobility, whichever way it is. Um, and there's also a series of identifications. Uh, which, which, you know, I, I put into the imaginary order here. Other things that that are um, mobilized to divide uh, uh, people on, on class lines and and within class lines. Um, you know, the the uh, considerations of race, gender, sexuality. All of these things are are mobilized often by those of the ruling classes to to further oppress and, 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 and denigrate. And, and these three uh, orders if combined, I, I think give, give an understanding of, of class and, and, uh, and, and uh, the, the relations of capital under, under capitalism. And I, I also appreciate the reference to Trotsky's notion of permanent revolution. I, I find as an aside that uh, part of one of the, um, challenges the left faces uh, in the current moment is 
the 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 facing up to the the historical tradition of of revolution um, and the the changing registers by which we maintain a fidelity to a revolutionary project and you uh, identify the notion of permanent revolution as what distinguishes the left in its pure form in a certain way it's um therefore a kind of um uh, a very significant concept that we must in fact retain so maybe to conclude i i wanted to ask you a little about um to speak a little bit more about about this and uh, what that notion of permanent revolution might look like uh today especially because today as as we know we have such a fractured and a kind of fundamentally different um field of class struggle i mean class struggle is no longer aligned uh in a in a symmetry with labor in the in the same way that we had in the 20th century so what does permanent revolution in fact um look like uh uh today I think I think you're right. I think it looks like uh, quite a challenge, in, in, indeed, as something to to attempt to implement. Um, uh, its meaning um, is is to extend beyond socialism in, in one country. It's is to complete, if you like, the, the revolution. Uh, what I was also trying to draw out in the concept is is that it that it uh, hints at the permanency of the revolution once it's got to that stage the sort of worldwide stage but also the the uh perpetuity of of being revolutionary and not not getting stuck and not becoming uh too conservative continuing on with um uh making changes to to make another world possible um, always and and i think this can be read also into the into the practice of psychoanalysis and and, and where where there, there might be uh, a, a revolutionary element to to psychoanalysis is is our um combating resistances to 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 uh, make another subject possible yeah indeed and you even see it in lacan's notion of symptom itself which is a kind of um a symptom which persists but which must be um a kind of lifelong uh commitment to to it to its alteration and so on so i really appreciate uh the work um, and thank you for being our first guest on this uh, interview series. So, uh, Dan, it's been it's been an honor to to learn from you. And uh, uh, do you have another uh, project in the works? I I, I have been working on something. Um, it's it's sort of it's sort of on the back burner a little bit, but um, and it's it's quite it's quite different. It's uh, it's a a book on uh, the fiction of Simone de Beauvoir. And um, and theories of non-monogamy. Uh, so trying to 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 uh, look at how Beauvoir writes about non-monogamy um, and how she sort of practiced it in her life with with Sartre. Yeah. Um, so yeah, quite a, quite a quite a different project, but uh, that that might see the light of day at some point. Oh, very cool. Well, hey, again, thank you very much, and we'll be in touch. Uh, All the best. Absolutely.